everyone, and thank you to Adventures of Commercialization. Today, we have Bradley Allgood. Um, I'm really excited. I'd first of all like to thank Erica Lill, if you remember from previous episodes, who has connected us to Bradley today. So welcome, Bradley. Glad to be here. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're up to these days. Yeah, uh, so my name is Bradley Allgood. I'm currently Chief Executive Officer of Fluent Finance, which is a bank-led uh, federated stablecoin, so largely focusing on federating the custodies between multiple institutions and minting a stable coin and having a level of transparency on the collateral and, and, and real-time auditing that can inhibit trust uh, within stable coins. Uh, largely my career uh, in the past seven years has been focusing on transforming uh, legacies and governments. First started with founding uh, the Startup Societies Network, which is the largest think tank for special economic zones uh, that focus on uh, innovations in policy, distributed governance, things of that nature, uh, has a peer reviewed journal, research institute, and really helps to, to provide uh, you know, real world education to people that are looking to set up special jurisdictions and special economic zones around the world. Uh, people that aren't super familiar with what those are, you know, Hong Kong to China, it's a good example of them. Uh, uh, Singapore to Malaysia, uh, DIFC in Dubai, they're essentially plots of land that have different economic policies to create greater development or economic development within the, the host country. Uh, moved to the board there, still serve on the board there, and uh, quickly got into the for-profit side, seeing that the gap to reach citizens uh, wasn't just policy, but there's a huge gap in technology. So service a lot of governments around the world in designing better systems for people registries, property registries, uh, early sovereign and autonomous digital identities, uh, using blockchain technology, both public and private, even uh, tokenization of carbon credits to tokenization of real estates using non-fungible and fungible tokens. So uh, very broad range. Uh, governments move quite slow, and this was quite a bit ago, and, and they weren't really re ready to take the leap in implementing a lot of these blockchain technologies that we designed. So I moved to something that was a little bit faster, but not a not a ton, and that's commercial banking. So I, about three years ago, set out and traveled through Asia, Latin America, the US, and spent a lot of time talking to central banks, regulators, and tier one financial institutions, understanding why the unbanked problem exists and the underbanked problem existed. Uh, given that we had such a wide range of technology and I knew what cryptocurrency could do to solve last mile, as they call it, to reach the end consumer, um, and uh, what I figured out is there was a, a whole bunch more than just technology risk for these institutions. There was lack of regulatory clarity. There is uh, no, not understanding how to do the accounting. Uh, there was risk departments that are adversely incentivized to say yes. And then there's lastly, obviously bureaucracy, the bigger the organization, the more hoops it has to go through to get out. Uh, so from there, I built a team of you know, senior bankers from tier one financial institutions, educated them on blockchain technology and quantum computing and better custody and went out into the market and started servicing the space and helping innovative companies find homes and large core banking systems and tier one financial institutions. And that's actually when I, I met my co-founder in uh, Fluent. His name's Oliver Gale. He is the uh, founder of Central Bank Digital Currency and did the first one in the Eastern Caribbean. And the company he founded has gone on to do them in Nigeria and other places. And, uh, and that's, you know, we really saw a big gap when we were talking to a lot of these large institutions, uh, finding a way to bridge from traditional finance to DeFi, uh, giving them a solution that, that, that can really help them, help them uh, onboard and, and access the, the massive yields and economic opportunity and ability to kind of reach their consumers in new ways. Uh, so that's, that was the, the founding of Fluent. That's wonderful, finding solutions in all different ways. Um, so you sound like a real uh, serial entrepreneur to me, um, all the steps that you've taken to get to where you are today. Um, what would you say, so you're, we're talking about stablecoin. There's a lot of uh, people out there that are a little bit hesitant to get into this market of you know, cryptocurrency, blockchain. Um, what is the stablecoin and how does that set this apart? Yeah, I mean, so stable coins is something that is has been around for some time. Uh, Tether was one of the very first ones, uh, which was a version that we call institutional stable coins. And largely they were driven as a means to settle out, a, a, seam, a more seamless means to settle out of highly volatile assets like Ethereum and Bitcoin into something that's stable. So when the market goes up and down, 
you have something that you can kind of hedge yourself with. Uh, that then quickly grew to various different forms of institutional stable coins with you know, everything from like Paxos where they have a banking charter, Circle, which their custody is managed by uh, BlackRock, uh, Tether, uh, obviously an offshore kind of depository opportunity. There, uh, there's also algorithmic stable coins, which has been really hot on the news. And that focuses on using math and, and some sort of price stabilizing mechanism um, and often a, a, a volatile collateral uh, to be able to, to, to create stability. But ultimately, the goal is to try to have something that is 100% stable as much of the time, right? If not all the time, uh, that you can trade out of um, and, and, and enter into the crypto market, launch on exchanges. Uh, you know, it's, it's largely meant for the, the hedge funds, and the traders and other participants. And then recently uh, in the DeFi craze, it's been a mechanism of yield because you can essentially stake stable coins into different protocols and, and you generate a yield. So people that hold stable coins, you know, in, in the case of a, holding a bank account, you're looking at, I don't know, 1% interest rate in a savings account. It's, it's very minimal, but in stable coin, you know, regular consumers and retail, we're, being, we're seeing anywhere from seven to 14% and in some cases, even 20% yield on their money. So helping the, the lowest income classes in many ways uh, build more wealth. That's great. Will definitely help um, all all different sectors of business. But what about current events that are happening right now? So we have seen a lot in the news about the market being, you know, very volatile. What? How can stablecoin help this, or how is it affected by it? Well, to be quite honest, it's a stablecoin's fault. Is why the market got so volatile. Uh, there was a stablecoin called Terra. Well, UST. So Terra Luna. Um, it is. It was a protocol-based stablecoin. It was an algorithmic stablecoin. Uh, it had a means uh, to to stake and generate yield. And what it had done is largely uh, said that you know, in the case of buying up a whole bunch of Bitcoin in the case of a market crash, that it would liquidate Bitcoin um, as well as its its uh, um, Luna token and and receive you know another dollar. Uh, in in which case. The actors in the market had a lot of liquidity, pushed down the price. You know, there's still a lot of speculation to exactly what 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 caused it. But um, at the end of the day, the price of Bitcoin heavily affected what their collateral and their collateral reserves are, or so say, like what is backing the stablecoin, or what can restore the peg. Um, and in the case of a market downturn, they're forced to sell off a market downturn in Bitcoin, which creates concern in cryptocurrency um, and creates a, a requirement for a uh, for a re redemption, right, of their, their stable coin. Uh, and, and then their only other option is to sell uh, their existing governance token, which took about a 95% dive, or Bitcoin to restore the peg. And if Bitcoin's already going down, it's essentially a, a downward spiral, right? You're selling into a lot of sell pressure in billions of dollars. And, and that's what we saw. We saw a collapse of the market. Um, and this was, you know, largely a validation of uh, algorithmic stable coins having huge issues because, you know, for the sake of not wanting to do KYC and AML in many cases, um, and in some other, some other stakes, you know, there's, there's, there's other use cases, but that's largely, largely the reason um, you're, you saw a, a need to try to predict everything that can happen, um, which is really impossible. So, you know, a lot of the principles that, um, you know, I, I focus on in, in particularly with stable coins is, is making sure the collateral is as secure as possible and as uh, you know less to less targetable. Because if someone targets, you know, takes a billion dollars and targets the price of Bitcoin, that can affect uh, that affected Terra Luna's, Luna's underlying reserves. And so there's countries uh, personally. This touches my heart because I have grew up in El Salvador for eight years. Uh, but I have seen recently that countries are taking up Bitcoin as a national currency. Yeah. How does that work? And, and can stablecoin, uh, do they play a role in that? Yeah, definitely. So uh, in the case of El Salvador, they don't, they never had a, uh, a currency, right? They always had used US dollars and they made the determination to use US dollars in Bitcoin. So now they have a fiat currency and a Bitcoin um, and bridging between the two is often taken, requires a lot of patchwork services. And you're always doing a constant kind of spread analysis. So if someone wants to on-ramp um, US dollars into Bitcoin and, and, and grow their Bitcoin treasuries or vice versa, 
there's constant price oracles and there's volatility that people have to be concerned about. What is really interesting in the case of like an adoption of stablecoin, um, uh, it, it makes it much easier for that bridge to happen because rather than having to take the fiat, which is held in a core banking system um, and tied to a central bank somewhere, uh, you know, held at a large commercial bank, taking that and then bridging it into uh, a, a public network through an exchange into USD to Bitcoin pair. In the case of having already a stable coin minted off of that underlying collateral, uh, you would be able to much more seamlessly transact between, uh, between the two. So having something that is minted to a public, uh, a public network like, uh, like Ethereum or, uh, you know, you could do Solana or Polygon or, you know, there's, there's quite a few near. Having, it, having liquidity on those platforms and also having the stable coin on those platforms allows a really seamless switch between them. So I think it's really important. I think that uh, any, any, any non-central banking currency country like the Eastern Caribbean, like uh, what they're doing in, in El Salvador, really, if they're going to be digitally transforming, they need to digitally transform both the fiat side and the stable coin. Um, with their commercial banking ecosystem, as well as the cryptocurrency and the Bitcoin, if they're going to start accepting more legal tenders. And our, so we talked about platforms for trading, and I know that that's probably the, the biggest way that people are working with this type of currency. But are, are we going to have like ATMs where you can trade this in now that we're getting banks involved? How does that work? Yeah, I mean, ultimately, that one of the biggest use cases for uh, stable coins and like on the institutional side uh, is, is Visa and MasterCard settling card schemes. So normally the way you, you have to settle card schemes is you're gonna have you know, very kind of, you're gonna have merchants that are accepting the cards, you're gonna have banks that are issuing cards, they're gonna have banks that they're settling to, and there's this big amount of liquidity that has to move constantly. Well, in the case of a stable coin, it can settle immediately across um, public networks, rather than having to go from one bank into another bank through a traditional transfer system. Uh, and you can focus on end of day settlements, which Visa Connect does a really good job of. They're one of like the largest kind of uh, real time settlement systems uh, that have like a trillion dollars in some days moving liquidity on the system. So when you have that big of a pool of liquidity, it makes it much easier to kind of settle these cards and these debit cards and pull things out and 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 and, and trans, transact from stablecoin and then it have enter back into the real banking system enter back into card schemes and you know visa and debit cards and credit cards and things like that so it, it is a stable coins are a key component to for these institutions to be able to adopt and use crypto because what an institution can't do like visa is accept bitcoin as a means of payment again because of the volatility but also because the, the regulatory clarity and the internal general ledger accounting that they would have to do, it's just not developed yet. Um, and if you use a stable coin, it's literally the same thing as a US dollar. So it's the closest analog that they've currently operated. Just in the case, this case, rather than having a closed database, it is a distributed database on a public blockchain. There's a lot of businesses I've seen popping up re recently that have, say, checkout systems that are um, normally cash-only businesses, but they are allowing cards to be used if they are purchasing some sort of like a cryptocurrency. It could be really volatile, such as a Bitcoin. Is it possible that we could be using like some sort of a stable coin at this level of business? Yeah. Yeah. Stable coins ultimately will provide merchants less fees than their current current options, right? So when they go through card networks, they're, they're, they're leveraged with fees pretty like two to 3%. In some cases, in this case, you can settle with a stable coin. Um, also, when you look at the way that cards came into the ecosystem, it was, it really was focused on building networks, right? It was building like expanding your network to have more merchants accept your card to have more banking access and so on and so forth. And what's public networks and public blockchains do means you don't have to expand your network. It's already global. As long as someone has a public private key pair, an ability to store it, an occasional ability to access internet, then they can start to transact. So rather than having to expand your, your existing system, you just have to give them the essentially the capabilities to, to transact in, in the cryptocurrency, um, and then it's borderless and global. That's great.
So taking a step back now, um, let's talk about you a little bit, Bradley, and uh, the journey that you, it sounds like you did a really great job at pivoting when you thought that like technology was really the next step. Um, what other types of hurdles have you experienced as an entrepreneur that we can let other entrepreneurs know about? Well, in my, my particular case, my hurdles have always been that investors don't really know what I'm talking about when I'm first working on stuff because special economic zones have not been in venture capital. You know, they were not in venture capital five years ago, six years ago. Um, it was a really long road to educate people. And then, you know, I did blockchain really early on. And again, venture capitalists at that point were like, I don't understand how this blockchain thing is going to be effective. I don't understand why a government would want a better identity system. You know, so my hurdles have been largely around education and, and, and doing things a little bit uh, ahead of larger adoption and an understanding. Um, even now, when I'm trying to put per, like propel this stable coin, uh, you know, it's, it is a significant amount of education to just get people to understand and institutions to understand the benefits that stable coins can offer them. And then to help them also understand what are the differences? How does this stable coin better fit their needs um, than, you know, Paxos or Circle or so on and so forth. So it's a lot of the hurdles in, in my case are, are, are related to education and, and, you know, getting the right people to, to understand the, the vision that you're trying to execute. And how, what kind of funding have you received? So are you just from your board or have you crowdsourced funding for this? Uh, are there other people backing you from, you know, the general public? Yeah, so uh, I went through a process, um, you know, when I, my previous company, once I identified a need here, my previous company, um, which I still have, but is, is largely on hold as we're kind of working on this, invested, you know, the first, first check, uh, we brought together a team, uh, started getting everyone to, to work together, building, designing everything we're going to do. We went out and did a pre-seed. We had like a block wall, uh, big brain holdings and master ventures and a few other kind of influential people from MakerDAO and other parts within the ecosystem, Solana, so on and so forth, that parts participated on an individual basis. Uh, and, you know, we did a uh, pre-seed, $3 million pre-seed, and since then have moved into our seed round, and we have a lot of really great uh, partnerships, all of them with strategic partnerships with people that are looking to mint a more institutional stable coin. Uh, so these are, you know, typically large institutions, anywhere from billion dollar to hundreds of billions and trillion dollar balance sheets uh, that, that see value in having a more regulated stable coin that they can interface with, that the way that the collateral is managed fits their needs and also the way that uh, they get to manage their, their customers and their clientele within that ecosystem also fits their needs. That's great, strategic, uh, strategic relationships. Our networking is key. And I think that that's come up very frequently on this show is that getting yourself out there and really networking your cause, education in your case. Um, so with everything that's happening in the current market, are people hesitant to invest in something like this? Is it they're yeah, hesitant to invest. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. Just in, uh, just in, you know, just the space that it's in. Not necessarily, you know, once they've learned about what it is, is these current events are these affecting you greatly? So, um, within the crypto space and within traditional equities, uh, both have constricted quite significantly. It's a hard market to raise in. We're facing a recession that's going to that's relatively imminent. Um, you know, it is. The people like are taking and tightening their valuations. You know, you the valuation you were raising in cryptos two months ago should be different than it is currently if your business is relatively the same, right? So if you started to raise two months ago and you're, you know, you need to like sit down, talk to the investors that are, that you trust and that are close to you, and uh, get a, some insight into a valuation that's going to be a little bit better. So entrepreneurs really need to consider. Um, capital runway as the priorities uh, and then finding investors at whatever price you need to, to get the money in to live out the recession. Um, once you kind of get that liquidity in to live out the recession, it's really just focus on generating revenue and delivering your product because anyone in the crypto space that is surviving this shed, this, this winter, as they call it, um, I mean, hardly the same as the last winter. We're still at $30,000 Bitcoin price, maybe more today. Um, but the ones that survive that will be the next generation that will take adoption 
uh, to a greater level because now that we're we've gone through this whole attempt at having no KYC, no AML, everything's distributed, algorithmic stable coins, that's all that's that's gone. DeFi is never going to be the way that we perceived it in the past. It is all going to have KYC interactions. There's going to be different types of correct places to onboard and offboard the ecosystems. You're not, you know, everyone's a citizen of a country. They're not going to be able to to circumvent their taxes or anything like that. But with that, we're going to get the in the inflow of real institutional liquidity. Now, if you think about Bitcoin at two trillion dollars or crypto markets at two trillion dollars full market cap, right? It seems like a lot. Well, if you look at an organization like State Street, they have thirty eight trillion in assets under custody. Now, that's not all fiat. There's a broad range of securities and other things that are in there. But at the end of the day, these institutions drastically overshadow what we think we are in crypto. Um, and bringing that liquidity in is going to be a massive, massive, massive growth because there's a lot of technical compliance benefits. There's a lot of really good things about what crypto is that services what these institutions need. Um, and, and, and furthermore, once these institutions kind of go in and you can access a stable coin from your bank account, then it becomes retail adoption at a whole new scale. So the next generation of crypto is going to be regulated DeFi. Um, and it's going to be drastically impactful. It's they're going to be businesses that you know trillion dollar values very quickly and easily. They're going to you know be competing with the likes of Apple and others. Let's uh, let's take a look at your product here. So let's pull up Fluent website. So if our audience wants to take a look even further. This is what the website looks like. How many people are on your team, Bradley? Uh, about 30, 35. 30. That's great. Majority of, majority of that is <laughs> developers. Really, really good developers. <laughs> Got to source the great talent. Yeah, we're really fortunate. Our C-suite, um, my chief financial officer was the CFO of City of all of Latin America. Um, my COO is one of the senior, most senior managing directors from City. Um, we also have uh, team members that, you know, um, my CTO did the, the core banking integrations at the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank for their digital currency, as well as the Costa Rica Stock Exchange um, and a few others. So we have this team of, of people that have really executed things like this before um, and also come from a traditional finance background. And then we have another side of our team, which is you know, heavy DeFi leaders, One's one that brought DeFi to, to General Electric, she was the chief innovation officer there. Another one was, uh, you know, early, early board member at Celsius and helped them get to market. So we really kind of straddle both worlds in terms of our skills and our experience. And it really helps us get a balanced and focused look on how to take this to market. That's great. Hey, that's your team sounds very incredible. If so I know we only have a few minutes left and I did see in your background that you have some NFT experience. And so I'm curious just because in the blockchain and as we're tracking things and creating labels for things, a lot of these things are, let's say art. Art was bought or sold at some point in time and gains value by based on like who owned it or who created it, um, its timeline. And as we're seeing that on the blockchain, how, how are NFTs really playing into this market as well? Because it's all so, the art is in the eye of the beholder, right? Yeah. So NFTs have largely been underutilized. A lot of my experience with NFTs was using them for like to dictate things that are non-divisible. Uh, so like let's say a, a, a housing title or real estate proper a property real estate or a corporation, um, you would have a non-fungible token that would have metadata that relates to their like what that corporation is, what that piece of property is, who, and then that. NFT can be owned by an individual. Also, you can kind of from there kind of take the opportunity to create a whole bunch of fungible tokens that relate to percentage ownership of that NFT. Um, so there's 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 a lot of different things that you know when I was doing NFTs weren't related to art, um, but I do think NFTs have taken off as a as a means to validate and and create scarcity uh, within uh, art projects that are. Like that are digital, right? Because usually it was you you create a GIF and that GIF can be repurposed and downloaded and used again and so on and so forth. But now you can have just one version of that one GIF, um, and that created value uh, because people people wanted the scarcity and people saw it as a means that are, are going to upgrade. Where I think NFTs are going to have to go um, to really stay viable is they all have to be gamified. They have to have some sort of 
gamification, some sort of benefit excitement that can be done by merging certain NFTs together or giving them properties, uh, but furthermore, implementing them in games. So the, again, when I was talking about people building their networks uh, with, with uh, games, it's been the same way. So if you think of, wow, it's a closed network, right? But imagine you go into wow and you go through this process and you get this piece of armor and that piece of armor is written to an NFT on a public network. Now it can be taken off that, that wow network and can be traded seamlessly um, and, and, and actually accrue much more value uh, for the participants. So uh, really gaming is, is probably one of the best use cases for NFTs and will be one of the best use cases when implemented right. Uh, it largely hasn't, hasn't seen its place to market yet. That's so great. Thank you so much. I just knew that was a part of your background and I've had a lot of people asking me to get some information for them. So I really appreciate that. So I know we're at time. Bradley, if you had one piece of advice for entrepreneurs today, you've already given us a great load of it, but just one last uh, note to take on this. What would you give them today? Um, remain tenacious. Just do not give up. Like it's always going to be hard. It's never easy. It's never, never comes to you quickly. Um, just wake up every morning and, you know, some days are harder than others and you have to go back to sleep and wake up the next day and try again. Um, so just yeah, never give up. Thank you so much. And thank, thank you audience for joining us for another week of Adventures of Commercialization. Um, we are here to talk about ways of making money and business every other week at 1 p.m. Hawaii Standard Time. So thank you so much and we'll see you in two weeks. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.